So, as Dr. Bishali has told, how do you manage a case of intermediate uveitis? This is a case uh, just few days back before I ca came here. A 46 year old male from Tanzania, actually, it happens from Tanzania, doesn't matter where from it is, came to my clinic with left eye dimness of vision. He was a known diabetic and hypertensive, and he had already received it two intravitreal injection of triamcinolone for cystoid macular edema. He is diagnosed elsewhere as a chronic uveitis, and the record shows his vision was 6.5 in the right eye and 6.9 in the left eye. Antechamber was quiet. There is a flare, one plus cells uh, uh, trace. So this was the picture, record which the patient had. 13, 12, 2022, she he came to me complaining of blurring of vision in the left eye. He was a diabetic with HB1C 11.6. Base corrected visual acuity 6.6 right eye and 6.36 left eye. Near vision was N18. There was a mild flare and cells in the anterior chamber with spillover. Vitreous cells 2 plus and vitreous cells 1 plus. And this was the vitreous cells that the patient was having. So we did an OCT. OCT showed cystoid macular edema with the neurosensory retinal detachment, spread underneath. And this was what the patient was having. We made a diagnosis of intermediate uveitis, spillover anterior uveitis with cystoid macular edema. He had uncontrolled diabetes. We give, her, give him the intervitreal injection, ojudex, and topical steroids in the left eye. This is a scenario of a case of intermediate uveitis. What is intermediate uveitis? How do you manage it? Few points, salient points, I'll be highlighting it. It's the information that predominantly involves the anterior vitreous, peripheral retina, and pars plan of the ciliary body. There's a two terms is there. One is the pars planitis, and another is the intermediate uveitis. Pars planitis is that subtype of intermediate uveitis which a snowball exudates in the vitreous and snowbank formation in the pars plana. There is no association of systemic disease in that case. And this is the sun group of classification of intermediate uveitis in the two subtype, pars planitis type and non pars planitis type, where you get the vitreous cells and flare only. And pars planitis you get in pars plana exudates and snow banking. And this is a typical pars planitis associated with snowbank. It's usually idiopathic. What are the complaints we should ask for? You, the patient will, obey off, off, will always tell that I have got floaters, painless blurring of vision. There can be dramatic vision loss if there's a very rarely with a hemorrhage, disc edema, cystoid macular edema. Pain is associated with the secondary glaucoma can be seen. Anterior segment, quiet eye, band shaped keratopathy, mild anterior chamber reaction. Martin Pett KPs can be associated in sarcoid or TB, peripheral anterior synechia, posterior synechia, secondary glaucoma. And the vitreous characteristically showed this kind of snowball exudates. Mild to moderate vitreous says, snowball opacity, snow banking, retinal vasculitis, and peripheral retinal neovasculation particularly seen in the children. If you look in the slit lamp, you should focus behind the lens. And this is the anterior vitreous face will show vitreous strands of opacity and vitreous cells. And these vitreous cells can be picked up by high magnification. And the snow banking, this is a photograph which captured the snow banking. Cystoid macular edema can be seen, dull foveal reflex, sometimes macular hole formation, retinal vasculitis, retinal detachment, disc edema. Natural course is self-limited only in 10% cases. It's usually smoldering or recurrent, about 80, 90% cases, 59% smoldering, recurrent 31% cases. The disease which I keep in differential diagnosis in our country is sarcoidosis and tuberculosis. Rarely it can be associated with the multiple sclerosis. I have seen about five to six cases. Lyme disease. 
And this is the paper which we have published in IGO 2022. 29 patients of sarcoid intermediate uveitis is one of the common intermediate uveitis, common cause of intermediate uveitis in our country. We also published PCR proven analysis of 22 cases of 14 cases where they did the SC tap where there is a spillover anterior uveitis was there. This is one of the example of a case of a 14 year old girl who has got broad posterior synechia and there was a vitreous exudate with a lot of vitreous haze were there and this patient undergone vitreous uh, vitrectomy, diagnostic vitrectomy and this uh, diagnostic and therapeutic vitrectomy and the uh, vitreous specimen nested PCR and real-time PCR showed a microectomy tuberculosis. The patient responded well with a course of anti-TB and steroid. Masquerade syndrome Toxocariasis, ill disease, amyloidosis can be kept in the differential diagnosis. The most important differential diagnosis I keep is the intraocular lymphoma, particularly in the elderly patient, over 50 years of patient having vitreous says. This is a toxocara, and you can have see the snow banking kind of presentation, but you will have a vitreous strands of coming from the periphery to the optic disc. One can have woolly strands of vitreous opacity. This is a rare case scenario where vitreous amyloidosis was seen. Vitreous lymphoma, as I mentioned to you, one of the differential diagnoses should be given. This was published from the Dr. Manfred um, um, group. Um, you can see the cells in the vitreous would be large, much larger. That's a pointer. And, uh, we can have a aurora borrelius and vitreous exudates uh, with a yellowish lesion in the backdrop. So how do I laboratory workup? I do routinely CBC, DLC, ASR, HSCT chest. I don't do the chest X-ray. Mantu, Ceramesi, Quantiferent, TB Gold, both I have done. And not all cases, majority of the cases I do the RPR, VDRL, and TPHA. This is an example of a 25-year-old female, blurring of vision and floaters. Look for the vitreous cells and debris. What I do routinely, do an HSCT chest. Is it TB? An HSCT chest showed miliary tuberculosis, pulmonary infiltrate in the lung. And real-time PCR from AC type was 2,204 copies of the MTB DNA. And this is another case of uveitis where is the bilateral Intermediate uveitis, bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy was seen. We also reported a case or is in the preparation, intermediate methotrexate injection, intermediate uveitis associated with the multiple sclerosis, multiple periventricular lesion in the cerebral white matter, and the patient has got spillover anterior uveitis, and the vitreous cavity showed exudates and vitreous haze. What are the ancillary tests we do? I do routinely OCT, uh, majority of the cases where the foveal reflex is dull, FFA and UVM in selected cases. FFA can show the petaloid hyperfluorescence, but most of the interesting thing is that recently when we are doing routinely FFA, particularly in the children, we are seeing capillary farming in large percentages of the cases with uh, even the staining of the optic disc. When the people is small, uh, cataract precluding the view of the peripheral fundus, I get UVM done, and this UVM showing exudates in the fast region, and with the treatment, this exudates disappear, and you can see by UVM. OCT can show the macula, suspected macular edema cases, cystoid spaces of the macula, increased macular thickness. If I see that uh, sharp foveal reflux, I don't do OCT. But if, if there's any suspicion, I don't hesitate to do an OCT, which can pick up the cystoid macular edema and past priorities. How do you manage the case? Depending on the grade of intraocular inflammation, presence or absence of CME, cataract, vitreous opacity, tractional retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage. Most cases are mild, respond to the posterior subtenone injection. I used to love to give the posterior subtenone injection earlier, but now I, um, give more of a uh, systemic treatment. Triumphal astronide is give that one, posterior subtenone phase, repeated every 
four weeks, one to two such injection is required. You go in the posterior subtenant space, you usually move horizontally and then vertically go there and give as posterior as possible. Oral steroid bilateral cases, failed periocular injection, one milligram per kilogram per day, taper 10 milligram per week. What I do is that in immunosuppressive agents, because it's a long drawn disease process, therefore I prefer to put on the patient on immunosuppressive agents. I sometimes, or more often, put the patient on microfilmed mofetil, one gram twice daily with prednisolone and taper it gradually. Some patients may require low dose of prednisolone for a long time. Dexamethasone intravitreal implant is quite good when recalcitrant intermediate uveitis. It's a um, single-use application, suture-less office-based procedure, and works very well in cystoid macular edema, almost magical. Uh, within three days, uh, there is a resolution of macular edema, but there is a chance of rise of intraocular pressure, about 12% of the cases. Our experience of 20 eyes of the 15 patients we reported in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology showed a good resolution on the promising treatment option in case of macular edema in intermediate uveitis. So vitreoretinal surgery is required, intractable vitreous inflammation, vitreous opacity, unresolved vitreous hemorrhage, and 89.5% uh, uh, cases in site study had vitreous uh, vitrectomy done, and they have got increased incidence of remission. Complicated cataract is another um, complicable complication, 7.6% by one year, increased to 36.6% by 10 years. We, when you should do at least three to six months quite, quite high preoperative systemic steroid, IOL in the capsular bag may need to combine with personal vitrectomy in case of gross hypertony. Fecal emulsification with intraocular lens implantation in case of past chronitis, our seed has showed cystoid macular edema, submacular fibrosis, and epithelial membrane is the cause of poor visual recovery. In conclusion, it's a quite common type of uveitis. One in five uveitis, you will get intermediate uveitis. Rule out TB and sarcoid in our country. In the elderly, keep primary intraocular lymphoma in the mind. Individualized treatment, this is a very important point, and prognosis is relatively good, though it has got protracted course. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Biswas. Any questions for Dr. Biswas? I think essentially what he's told us that if you see a patient with vitreitis, first look at the age. If it is an elderly, look at the type of the cells, if they are large cells, and even sometimes in younger patients these days, lymphomas must be ruled out. Is that right? Yeah. And what are the do's, what are the don'ts for intermediate uveitis which you will not do? And I ah. think one of the don't is if you have the large cells, yes. please do not start steroids because it will mask the diagnosis of lymphoma. So I, well, you wait for two weeks uh, before uh, taking a biopsy. So yes. because biopsy, if you put the patient on steroid is often non-contributory. You may require repeat biopsy also. And it's always important to rule out infections and causes like sarcoidosis because vitreitis may be a manifestation of syphilis, TB, so it's not always parsplenitis, which has typical snowballs and is idiopathic. But the moment you see vitreitis, please rule out all the possible etiologies before starting the treatment. Thank you, Dr. Biswas. So our next speaker, uh, now is Professor Vishali Gupta. I think she needs no introduction. She's from PGI Chandigarh and the current president of the uh, IUSC group, Professor Vishali. Thank you. So the topic for me is the choroditis. What are the do's and don'ts? One thing you have to remember about choroditis that there is a very close call between infection and inflammation. So how do we go about it? I'll show you example of this case. Now this is a patient, uh, it's one of the white dots if we call it, or you see the patches of choroditis out there, and you do fluorescein. 
So look at the fluorescein very carefully. The fluorescein is showing hypo, but when we go to the late frames, it is showing a very uniform hyper. It's not that the edge is leaking. Now this uniform hyper, when you see, this is suggestive of AMP, APM, PPE, which by the way, we do not see very commonly in India. You look at something similar clinically. It looks similar, kind of, what I showed you, choroditis, yellowish. Then you do the fluorescein. Fluorescein shows a bit different. It's mostly mixed, but when you go to the late phase, you see this edge. The edge which is leaking and there is dye which is coming between the affected and the diseased retina. Now see the edge here, it's hypo, becoming hyper with leakage. This is serpiginous choroditis or serpiginous like choroditis. And we come to the third disease where I think I put the animation wrong, I'm not able to show the fundus, but it looks similar. And when you do fluorescein, you have a ground glass appearance. This is syphilis. So here is all the three of them together. This is yellow patch in the fundus. This is APMPP. This is yellow patch. This is serpiginous choroditis. And this is the lesion which I wanted to show you, a placoid kind of a yellow patch. But look at the character of the fluorescein. This is syphilis. So this is what I meant to say, that there is a very close call between infection versus non-infection, because if you look at them, they all look similar. But there are very important imaging biomarkers, as well as clinical biomarkers, which you can pay attention to and you know get the appropriate test done so that suppose you look at this patient which is actually a syphilis and you think it is APMPP and do not treat it it's going to be a problem you look at this patient of serpiginous and you think it is APMPP and do not suspect infection it is again going to be a problem or you see a patient of APMPP and think it is TB and unnecessarily treat him with anti-TB drug, that again is a problem. So what do, how do we approach this patient? There are a couple of questions that should be asked about every patient of choroditis that we see. So is it choroditis or is it retinochoroditis? Is there any associated involvement of optic nerve head? Is their clinical features fit into any known infection or non-infection? Is there associated inflammation? Uni or multifocal, unilateral, bilateral, systemic disease? What was the previous episode like? And even if the patient is on treatment or you have started the treatment, is it responding the way it should? Now I'm going to give you one or two clinical examples on how you will ask these questions for every patient of choroditis that walks up to you. This is an example of the first patient, a 29-year-old boy. He has received multiple intravitreal triamcelones, oral steroids, even TB treatment for almost eight to nine months before he came to us. His vision here is counting finger and you can understand that's not a surprise. Now, I asked you a couple of questions which you should be asking. So the first question was, is it choroditis or retinochoroditis? Well, this is retinochoroditis. There was associated vitritis. It's an immunocompetent patient. It is unilateral. But the important question I also asked, what was the past episode like? Now, let's look at the first episode. This is the picture that patient was carrying with him and you will realize that the, most of the uveitis patients carry that huge file with them which they are very keen to discuss with you and somehow you don't want to look at everything in past. But look at this. This is how the patient comes. You may do a number of investigations including vitreous biopsies 
But if you look at what it was like in the first episode, the diagnosis is written on the face. It's a case of Toxoplasma retinochoroditis, which was missed as TB. Patient was treated for TB, patient was treated with steroids, and we ended up in a lesion like this. This should not happen if we know our very basic humble stuff. We do not need omics, our micro, you know, we don't need any of the fancy stuff to know that this is toxoplasma and we have to give a specific therapy to this patient. So this patient eventually underwent vitrectomy and everything and these are the toxocysts from the vitreous. Another classical example is this example. So if you look at the phenotype, it's periperipillary, pseudopodia-like, projecting from the optic nerve head, and there is no vitreitis. Now this is what has been classically described as serpiginous choroditis, which is of immune variety, and you see on autofluorescence, there is an active, you know, hyperautofluorescence at the edge. So this grows along the edge very typically and when you see it, this is non-infective by and large. What we confuse it with is TB. TB is different. It is serpiginous like choroditis. It is very different from this form. It has choroditis which is multifocal. You may have associated vitreitis, associated anterior segment inflammation which should not happen in the autoimmune variety of serpiginous choroditis. Unilaterality is by and large common. If you see scleral involvement along with serpiginous like choroditis, TB is a very, very likely diagnosis. So always keep that in mind. And when we do fluorescence in ICG, you find typically the center of the lesion will be healing while the periphery of the lesion will be active. This is what is serpiginous like choroditis and this presentation one should always rule out infection, most commonly tuberculosis. For example, in this patient, Montus was 20 into 20, Quantiferon was positive. He even had CT, but believe me, all the three is not common to have positive, even if one or two is positive, and you have the clinical phenotype, good to start treatment. And this is how these patients would respond to good uh, treatment with anti-TB. So I think uh, I will go to my algorithm instead of giving the whole talk, because I would like to spend some time here. So if it is a choroditis, you first see what kind of choroditis is it. Is it diffuse or multifocal? If it is diffuse, do a simple OCT and see if it is the retina involved or it is primarily the choroid involved. If it is the primary involvement of retina and choroid is just secondarily involved, it could be toxo or viral. If it is primarily choroidal involvement and it is diffuse choroditis, it is serpiginous choroditis. That could be autoimmune. I showed you an example, which is bilateral, no inflammation in the eye. And the lesions are mostly in the juxta papillary region and they are not multifocal. If it is serpiginous-like, which is infective, mostly TB is unilateral, there would be associated vitreous or anterior segment inflammation, though not always. Lesions generally begin in the posterior pole, they are multifocal, and you may have associated vasculitis. If it is an autoimmune, honestly, the literature does not say you have to investigate, so you can start the treatment and investigate if you do not find a good response to steroids. But if it is the infective kind of a phenotype, always investigate to rule out infectious etiology, TB being the commonest, at least in our country. If it is a multifocal choroditis, again see, 
does it belong to a classical phenotype of mutes, ampi, pick? If it is any one of those entities, there is no investigations in the first step, only if there is recurrence. Whereas if it is multifocal and has an atypical phenotype which you cannot fit into, always investigate to rule out the uh, possible etiology. So these are the do's and the don't start, don't start a therapy blindly without knowing the exact cause of it. Don't be in a hurry to start specific Therapy, non-specific, sometimes you can start like steroids, your vision is threatened and all. But please do not start specific therapy unless you already know what the cause is. Thank you very much. Anyone has any questions? Any questions on this talk? Thank you. So our next speaker is Professor Peter McCluskey. We are lucky to have him with us. He is one of the finest exponents on the art and science of scleritis and he comes from the University of Sydney in Australia. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I went to the wrong room. Um, <laughs> I've had a very interesting tour of the facility until I got here. So look, my, um, I've been asked to, to present a typical patient that we see with scleritis to talk about how we sort these patients out. And uh, so I've chosen a, one particular patient that I'm going to present, which illustrates a lot of the pitfalls of sorting out someone with scleritis. So this is a, a, an 84-year-old woman who presented with slowly increasing pain and blurred vision in her left eye that had come on slowly over a few weeks, steadily getting worse, and she now had quite significant dull aching pain and uh, that was stopping her from sleeping. Her right eye was normal, and in her left eye, as you can see, she's got reduced vision, some low-grade anterior chamber activity, some granulomatous KPs, and a moderate amount of vitritis and a low pressure. So this is just a straight on uh, image of her eye. You can see that uh, basically it's red and injected and there's something going on uh, in the sclera. If we get the patient to look up, you can see that there are multiple pale nodules of what could be necrotic sclera, what could be capillary closure and, and necrotizing scleritis. And nasally, as you can see in the other image there, there's a large area of avascular sclera and some sort of a, a, of a, a lesion over the top of it. So the first key point with scleritis is that it's all about the history. And there are very important clues in this patient's history. She'd had pterygium surgery approximately 45, 50 years ago. And back in the 70s, when patients had pterygium surgery, they always or nearly always had beta irradiation, sort of a local plaque therapy. And about 20 years after her pterygium surgery, she started to see an ophthalmologist regularly because she kept getting a funny lump on her left eye where her pterygium was, and the ophthalmologist would just debride it and say, come back in a year and we'll see how things are going. And this lesion was debrided every year until 2022, when after debridement this time, her eye became a little red and irritable. She was given some steroids and antibiotics, it settled down but then it came back and after that it steadily got worse and worse to the point where the ophthalmologist was worried that she had surgically induced necrotizing scleritis or a masquerade or something strange so sent it into the eye hospital where I work. So when she was seen in the ED department at first they were unsure what was going on and being an older person they were worried it might have been a masquerade so they got the uh, oncology group to have a look at her who uh, said it doesn't look 
like lymphoma. There's inflammation, and I don't know what it's like in your hospital, but in mine, the moment someone sees cells, they think, great, we can just refer that patient to uveitis and not have to worry. So just to remind you of the physical signs, the multiple lesions, particularly inferiorly, and this large avascular area of sclera. So we were very concerned with the history and the physical signs, of course. There's some sort of a plaque lesion where she's previously had surgery. We know that it's an ischemic area because of her uh, past history of beta irradiation. So the red flag is a history of surgery, a history of trauma. Uh, you always have to be concerned this could be infective scleritis. And it's usually either a gram-negative bacteria, classically pseudomonas, or, or a fungus. And so the key next point is you've got to get some tissue to work out what's going on. We started her on intensive topical and systemic antibiotics and organized uh, to take her to the operating theaters. We did some baseline uh, investigations and obviously took some swabs from the ocular surface, particularly nasally. They showed that there, there was obviously something going on. There were neutrophils, and they could actually see some gram-negative uh, bacilli. So we took it to the operating theater, debrided all that area, laid it all open. There was all, multiple lesions with, uh, with sort of uh, pus and liquidized sclera there, and uh, we sent uh, that tissue off for culture. And it came back with pseudomonas, uh, that, which fortunately turned out to be sensitive to ciproxin, uh, and all the cultures slowly over the next few days grew that. So with follow-up, sadly, despite aggressive antimicrobial therapy, she got steadily worse, uh, and in the end, she ended up with a blind, painful eye. She didn't want aggressive sort of local irrigation treatment, so in the end, uh, we uh, eviscerated her eye and discharged her pain-free with reasonable quality of life. But the important things in this particular patient are the red flags for infection. And we know that, as I said, a history of trauma, a history of surgery, in my country particularly, pterygium surgery. Last century, we used to use beta irradiation. This century, it's mitomycin. Uh, but either of those two things with surgery, high risk factors for not developing surgically induced necrotizing scleritis, but infective scleritis. And so we, the, the, the other groups of patients we always worry about are those who are just on chronic topical steroid therapy, patients who are immunosuppressed, and as uh, you know, Professor Gupta has pointed out, patients with active TB who can get scleral involvement. So in my next talk, I'm going to talk about a scleritis survival guide, but one of the five key points is that at least 10% of the scleritis patients that we see have infection as a cause. And just like in the previous talk, it was important to differentiate between inflammatory and infective causes of ocular inflammation. It's the same in scleritis. We have to make sure that we keep that differential diagnosis of infection, inflammatory, or a masquerade in our, in our sort of consciousness and actively go through that differential diagnosis. With scleritis, it's the history that usually gives you the clue as well as the physical examination. Clinical assessment is the key with then directed investigations. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor McCluskey. Any questions from the audience? So, uh, you know, I, I have a question. And we just heard a very f florid case of infectious scleritis, though the diagnosis was based on the microbiological investigation. So there are other forms of in infectious scleritis like tubercular or syphilis, uh, yes. you know, which may be very difficult to distinguish from non-infectious scleritis. So how do you go about tackling those? Yep. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it sometimes can be very difficult. Um, I think it depends to a certain extent on what part of the world you're in. For example, here in India, TB, an infectious TB is much commoner than it is in my country, uh, where we tend to see intraocular inflammation with TB. Uh, I think syphilis is a disease that we always have to keep in mind no matter where we are and pretty much the only investigation all my patients get is syphilis serology um, i think tissue is important when you're not sure we know that diseases like herpes viruses herpes simplex herpes zoster a cancer amoeba can cause infectious scleritis that can be difficult to pick up. And so again, I think it goes back to those basic principles, a careful history, going back and revisiting the history if your treatment isn't working uh, as appropriately as you expect it to do. And I think always keeping in mind, could this be infectious? Yeah. Thank you. Professor Peter, yeah. I wanted to ask you such a wonderful talk. Now, I wanted to ask you that surgically, surgically induced necrotizing scleritis, which is an immunological disease. Now, is there like sympathetic ophthalmia, since it is immunological, but infectious agent can trigger SINs? So, is there a chance that infection can trigger SINs? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think. I think that surgically induced necrotizing scleritis is now a very rare disease. It used to be common when we did large incision cataract surgery and when we had non-absorbable sutures for, for, uh, for strabismus surgery and when we did a lot more scleral buckling where there was a lot more trauma to the sclera. But as we've moved to minimally invasive surgery, it's become far less common and really the only time I see surgically induced necrotizing scleritis now is in patients who have a, an already diagnosed systemic vasculitis or a rheumatological disease, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, things like that. If their disease isn't well controlled and they have eye surgery, they can get SINs. But nowadays, it's pretty well always infective rather than inflammatory. That's Thank my you, idea. sir. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Makluski. If there are no other questions, we move on to the last talk of the day for which I have the honor of introducing myself. <laughs> and Professor Bastu needs no introduction. <laughs> No, the next one. Yeah. Second one, second from top, yeah. Second one from top. The second one. Yeah. So good afternoon, all of you. I'm glad to see so many people over here. So I, I take it that all of you are deeply interested in learning about uveitis. I come from L.V. Prasad Eye Institute. This is not moving. Okay. Right, so why is anterior uveitis important? I, it, most likely, majority of the people sitting here are general ophthalmologists. And in a general ophthalmology clinic, more than 90% of all the uveitis patients that come are likely to be anterior uveitis. And even in a tertiary care center, up to 40% of all patients are likely to be anterior uveitis. And it's not an innocuous condition. If we treat it inadequately or diagnose it inappropriately, then it can result in very significant visual and systemic complications. Also, the fact that a a lot of cases of pan-uveitis and intermediate uveitis may have a component of anterior uveitis which needs to be recognized. So what I'm going to discuss here is a three-step approach that should be useful to the general ophthalmologists who are sitting here. This is not a comprehensive cover of anterior uveitis. There are some of the forms that you might miss through this approach. But this should be able to cover majority of the cases that come to your general ophthalmology clinic. 
The first step is to confirm that you are actually dealing with anterior uveitis. The second is to look for the presence of granulomatous keratic precipitates. And these are the ones that have a volume. They are not just pinpoints on the endothelium. They have a volume. Those are the granulomatous keratic precipitates. And the third one is if there are no granulomatous keratic precipitates, then ask for a history of inflammatory joint pain. So I, I'll cover these things in detail as we go forward. So what should be the first thought when you see a patient who has been told to you to be having anterior uveitis or you get an impression that this might be anterior uveitis? The first thing is to rule out what is not uveitis. And as simple as this might seem, this is very, very often missed. Very commonly in patients at the extremes of age, patients with a history of trauma, which might be trivial, history of drug ingestion, and always keep looking for something which looks different. For example, if you look at this eye, there's hardly any circumciliary congestion. And if you look at what l appears like a hypopion, you will see that there's a lumpy, bumpy kind of appearance of that hypopion. So no circumciliary congestion, a lumpy, bumpy appearance, you might be dealing with something else. And this particular case happened to be a patient with leukemia. So also, you know, rule out the other causes of red eyes. Many times you have conjunctivitis being confused as uveitis and vice versa. So once you have made sure that this is truly uveitis, you have to find out the primary focus of inflammation. And again, easier said than done. You know, many of the patients, if you do not examine the fundus properly, you might just call it as anterior uveitis and keep treating the anterior segment while the disease progresses in the posterior segment. So it's never anterior till you have seen the fundus very carefully and not just a cursory examination. Now, this was a patient who presented with mutton fat keratic precipitates, and the first person who saw this patient just saw the posterior pole and missed out this large retinitis lesion that was lying in the suprotemporal periphery. This was clearly a case of toxoplasma retinochoroditis and it would have been disastrous if we had just treated the anterior segment of this patient. Another point to highlight here is that we often talk about spillover inflammation into the posterior segment or in the anterior segment, but remember it's not exactly spillover but the cyclitis which leads to the inflammation in the vitreous which you see in patients with anterior uveitis. So once you have made sure that you are dealing with inflammation with anterior uveitis where the focus of inflammation is in the anterior segment, look for granulomatous keratic precipitates, KPs with a volume and not just flat endothelial dusting. Very simply, this helps us in ruling out what is non-granulomatous. Now, this sounds very obvious, but if you keep this in mind, you won't investigate for the wrong uh, etiologies. However, there's a very important caveat here, and the caveat is that all granulomatous anterior segment inflammation starts and ends as non-granulomatous. So, for example, your, if your patient has already been started on topical steroids by the previous ophthalmologist, by the time you see this patient, those KPs would have gone. And then you might get a false impression of non-granulomatous, while the, actually the disease was granulomatous, which you will know if you look at the previous records of the patient. So what next if, if you uh, think it is granulomatous anterior uveitis? There are basically three categories that you want to classify into. Of course, there are several other causes, but for the benefit of this audience, I'll stick to three important categories. The first category are two most common causes of granulomatous anterior uveitis in our country, and these are tuberculosis and sarcoidosis. Now, iris nodules, this one has very florid iris nodules, but there are other patients where you may have to examine very carefully for the iris nodules. One feature that we see commonly in our sarcoid patients are the presence of these peripheral anterior synechiae. These are tented synechiae, which are very suggestive of sarcoid in, in the correct clinical setting. 
also in our country may may not be in, uh, in other populations we see these discrete hypopigmented spots in the inferior peripheral fundus in our sarcoidosis patient there is no other posterior segment inflammation except these spots so if you see those think of sarcoid and finally the tuberculin test is useful not only in the diagnosis of tuberculosis but a negative test may help you in the diagnosis of sarcoidosis as well so in these patients you look at the chest radiography preferably with a ct scan ask for a history of tb contact look for uh, other evidence of systemic tb including other extra pulmonary tuberculosis uh, look for evidence of systemic sarcoid and remember the diagnosis of sarcoid is not based on getting a serum angiotensin converting enzyme but by finding organ specific involvement of sarcoid which could not only be in the lungs but also be in the skin or in the cns and finally uh, dr kalpana is sitting here so getting a sherma test might be useful because dry eye is a characteristic of sarcoid while uh, the absence of a dry eye would suggest tuberculosis in case your diagnosis is in doubt so this is the first category of granulomatous anterior uveitis the second one again which is very commonly missed if you do not examine the fundus properly is its association with pan uveitis especially those patients where it's a recurrent form of wot koenage harada disease or the sympathetic ophthalmia so just a uh, easy fundus examination of this patient will show you this sunset glow fundus which will uh, take you to the diagnosis of vkh in these patients the third pattern that you need to identify is that of viral anterior uveitis and these are more commonly due to either herpes simplex virus or varicella zoster virus now the two p's that you need to remember for viral anterior uveitis are pigment and pressure if you see alterations of pigment the keratic precipitates are pigmented you see an iris atrophy where pigment has been lost or you see pigment dispersion in the anterior segment think of viral anterior uveitis similarly raised intraocular pressure should also guide you to the diagnosis of viral anterior uveitis now this is a patient with a very obvious uh, herpes zoster of thalamicus you can see the scars on the skin you see the sectoral iris atrophy in this patient on the uh, lower left hand side showing the uh, sectoral iris atrophy suggestive of zoster sometimes the iris atrophy may not be very obvious and you might see just a d shaped pupil as you can see in the picture on the top and then there is a category of where there is not much inflammation like you saw in the other pictures but the intraocular pressure is very high and that is cytomegalovirus anterior uveitis i'm not going into the details over here now this is one last category and uh, i i hope uh, many of you have already recognized this condition this patient would not have had any history of redness or pain he or she would have come to you with a history of decreased vision or sometimes with a history of floaters and you see these diffuse kps uh, on, on the corneal endothelium and this will lead you to the diagnosis of fuchs uveitis syndrome remember to do a good uh, counseling for the possibility of floaters post operatively uh, if you are planning for cataract surgery in this patient the other causes of white eye anterior uveitis as well apart from fuchs bechet's disease while it may have very significant intraocular inflammation there is not much of circumciliary congestion similarly juvenile idiopathic arthritis in children and all the masquerades will generally not have any red eye as you see in other forms of uveitis now i am coming to the last and i have saved it for the last because this is probably the most common cause of anterior uveitis you will see in your practice these are the patients who will have an acute onset of uveitis the disease will typically be unilateral or alternatingly unilateral uh, process zero to used to call it a ping pong kind of presentation then there is a history of inflammatory joint pain what is that the patient has a history of pain which is more when he gets up in the morning and then as he starts moving around the the pain is relieved so when you are talking to a patient of uveitis 
don't just ask for joint pain ask for a history of inflammatory joint pain like you see in this patient you might see fibrin in the anterior segment and always the posterior segment apart from vitreitis in some of these patients would be normal in these patients you would test for hla b27 because that is very likely to be positive if you get it positive in this kind of a presentation you don't have to do any other test in these patients you can inform the patient about the course of the disease and can refer the patient timely to the rheumatologist in case there is a history of inflammatory back pain or any other joint pain in these patients so some other clues that you know details that i you should know because this is probably the most common etiology of uveitis that you'll make in your practice irrespective of wherever you you are uh, practicing is that some of these patients will have a history of prodrome so they will know that this disease is coming and you know this is very useful when the test is negative in some of these patients the intraocular pressure if the patient has been untreated is typically low a high intraocular pressure means that the b27 is very very unlikely and as i told earlier if you see vitreitis it doesn't mean a spillover inflammation but it means that the disease is essentially an iridocyclitis and not an iritis alone so the cyclitis will naturally lead to the vitreitis in these patients the hla b27 is positive in most cases of ankylosing spondylosis and other spondyloarthropathies while it is negative in other uh, uh, diseases like psoriasis or inflammatory bowel disease where you may also see a chronic uh, course with a posterior segment inflammation there are certain triggers of the disease that you should be aware of many uh, people it gets triggered by stress including inadequate sleep and in some settings it gets triggered by uh, seasonal variations as well and finally the treatment for the systemic disease also has a relevance for the ocular disease because some of the treatment like sulfasalazine or methotrexate or the tnf inhibitor adalilumab will have a reduced rate of recur recurrences while if the patient is using etanercept and you have to ask for it the trade name is commonly enbrel there is a chance that it may exacerbate the ocular disease while relieving the systemic disease so coming back to the three step approach again confirm it is anterior uveitis there is no diagnosis without a thorough fundus evaluation look for the presence of granulomatous keratic perspirates including iris nodules peripheral anterior synechiae the pigment and the pressure the fundus for the sunset glow and the distribution the diffuse distribution for the fukes and these will all lead you to the different uh, patterns of diagnosis that we just discussed and if your kps are absent then ask for a history of inflammatory joint pain and with an additional history of ping pong presentation fibrin in the anterior chamber normal fundus this will lead you to the diagnosis of b27 anterior uveitis thank you for your attention thank you somya and that gives us uh, ample of time to discuss the approach and somya i would like you to be there uh, now you have a patient coming to your clinic which you beautifully showed us comes with anterior uveitis uh, what would be the we are talking on behalf of comprehensive they don't come to lbp they come to a small little clinic in the periphery so what should be the basic investigations they should be giving what is the treatment they can start without any investigations and what is the treatment they should not start for anterior uveitis yeah so uh, i'll go back to the presentation i just made uh, once you have made sure it's anterior uveitis you look for the granulomatous keratic perspirates if you see granulomatous perspirates you have to investigate these patients there is no doubt so about when it. you say investigate what are the base i'm sure you've told it Yeah. but what are the basic investigations and they should be ordering and because many a times you know you would also notice that the moment you see granulomas many a times the oral steroids are started in a panic so would you ever start your patient of anterior uveitis howsoever severe it seems 
on oral steroids and what are the situations you would give oral steroids for anterior uveitis? Yeah, so I'll first discuss about the granulomatous anterior uveitis. Like in our clinics, we say that there is nothing called as uveitis. It has to be, you know, qualified by the morphological presentation. And in this case, you have to call it granulomatous anterior uveitis. So once you have called that name, you have to investigate the patient for tuberculosis and sarcoidosis. Those are the important investigations. You have to investigate for syphilis. That's like absolutely, uh, uh, you know, a, a screening test that is important. Then you have to look for a pattern of viral anterior uveitis, which I just mentioned, and I assume that you would have ruled out a VKH. So TB, syphilis, and sarcoid are the three most important diagnoses that I would be looking for. And without that, I, I will not start the patient on any kind of uh, other treatments. Just the topicals. Yeah, just the topicals. On the other hand, you have a hypopion uveitis with four plus cells and hypopion. How would you approach that one? So uh, with the hypopion uveitis, of course, there are several other causes of hypopion uveitis. And I would want to rule out especially uh, any kind of end, uh, endophthalmitis. Sometimes the history of trauma could be very trivial. So it could be a post-traumatic endophthalmitis. Of course, it could be endogenous endophthalmitis. And once you have ruled all of them out, you come to the causes of endogenous uveitis, the two most important causes being B27 and Bechet's disease. And there are ways to distinguish these two. So suppose you have come to the diagnosis of B27-like and anterior uveitis even before your test has uh, come positive, then you are going to treat it with topical medications. And typically, these patients with an hypopion uveitis will also have very significant vitritis. And I would consider starting these patients on uh, oral steroids as well. But a very short course of oral steroids, they don't need a very prolonged course of oral steroids in these patients. And Peter, may I ask you, how would you what would be your indications of starting oral steroids for anterior uveitis? Thank you. Yeah, I think that certainly in my clinic, the commonest is severe uh, acute anterior uveitis of the type we were talking about that's classically B27 positive or similar to that. Those patients are, are usually otherwise well unless they have rheumatic disease, so they can tolerate oral steroids with minimal side effects. And these patients are often in a lot of pain and, and their visual acuity is often significantly reduced. So the quickest way to get on top of the inflammation is with a high dose of oral steroids, which, as Dr. Basu said, we only need for a relatively short period of time. That, that's probably the commonest time I use oral steroids. The other time, I think, is with granulomatous disease, uh, particularly sarcoidosis, if there's macular edema or other inflammatory-mediated threats to vision that you need to deal with. But I think the majority of the time, you can get away without oral steroids. So my next question, uh, any questions from the house we would welcome on interior uveitis, our approaching approach to the patient? Yes. Madam, I'd like to ask Basu. Sure. One uh, etiological thing he mentioned last about drug-induced. Recently, we have seen one case of a, a lady when brimonidine was put in this patient there was exaggeration of a granulomatous KPC in those cases. Immediately talk to JB sir about it, whether they have seen, and few glaucoma uh, people, whether they have seen a response of bremolin, because this, you know, again, works on the evil outflow system. So uh, whether the drug-induced granulomatous KPC would be an important entity in some of the situations. Yeah, drug-induced, of course, but brimonidine is not the most common cause of drug-induced uveitis. That said, we, in fact, this week I had one patient uh, who we were treating for uh, granulomatous anterior uveitis of a different etiology, which I don't remember, for which anti-glaucoma medications were started, including brimonidine, and this patient had a sudden exacerbation of the, you know, granulomatous response. Now, this is a very difficult situation because many of these patients need, uh, you know, anti-glaucoma medications for the treatment of uh, granulomatous anterior uveitis per se. So, you know, is it the disease or is it the drug response? You don't know. But this particular patient, once we stopped the brimonidine while continuing the same dose of anti-inflammatory therapy, 
it, it did go away. Thank you. Another Thank you. one is ciprofloc sometimes. Like we had a patient after refractive surgery. So he was on fluoroquinolone. I don't remember exactly which one. And there was a lot of pigment dispersion, which was confused with uveitis and patient received steroids and God knows what all. And then somebody saw the iris defects like Somia was showing and they said it was viral. And then they started treating with antiviral. So the drug induced, we have to be very careful because fluoroquinolones, ciprofloxx, moxifloxx can cause a pigment dispersion, which is uh, like a body and bait. I'm not talking about those, but one has to remember there could be a lot of pigment dispersion. You stop the drug, it reverts back. So it may not always be uveitis. Peter, would you like to say anything about drug induced? Yeah, I think just that I agree completely. We've got to keep it in mind, not only topical drops, but also bisphosphonates is the other group where we can see that causing uh, acute anterior uveitis. So yeah, I think particularly we've had the same problem with bromonidine. That's probably the commonest drug that we see causing uh, anterior uveitis. So probably if we suspect brimonidine is aggravating the existing inflammation or causing some development of new granulomas, maybe we can change it over to, uh, you know, another one. And maybe uh, you can collect these cases because if it is not documented in literature and you document it, it would be very useful for the management of these patients. Yeah. Yes, yes. Parth. I want to make one point that brimonidine induced uveitis has a peculiar tendency. It, it presents with mild uveitis and higher inflammation in the palpable conjunctiva compared to the bulb. I think ocular inflammation immunology, it has been reported. So palpable conjunctiva, uh, you have to know, uh, examine properly and there will be higher congestion compared to the bulbar conjunctiva. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, with this, I would like to ask Dr. Biswas. Uh, sir, you mentioned in your treatment, like you showed those four steps, PST can, for intermediate uveitis, PST can occur, then you said you'd prefer giving intravitreal also, then was oral steroids, immunosuppressive and vitrectomy. So how do you decide at what point of time to start immunosuppression? Would it be stepwise or are you following uh, the immunosuppression right in the beginning? Like, so, how do you decide? Earlier, I used to give the posterior subtonal injection as the first line of therapy and then oral step, immunosuppressive agent. Over the years, I felt that these are the, such a chronic disease. One injections and uh, two injections is not enough. And they require a long-term treatment. And most of the times, it's a kind of a systemic disease. I tend to now put the patient straight away immunosuppressive agents with the steroids. So the moment you see a patient with pars planitis, whether it is unilateral or bilateral, you, I, would, I, you would start immunosuppression, immunosuppression if other etiologies... Uh, if it's not contraindicated or if the patient uh, does want uh, some vitritis or uh, patient wants some quick relief, um, then I give. So do you have a, any particular choice of immunosuppression? I give microphonolet mofetil. Microphonolet. And for how long would you treat these patients? So actually at least for uh, three months, initial high dose, two tablets two times daily, uh, two to three months, and then I just taper it off. But prednisolone, I keep it at 10 to 15 milligram for quite a long time. So Soumya, we come to you. Uh, would you follow the same as Dr. Biswas is saying? for intermediate uveitis. And another question to you, like many a times intermediate uveitis, when we do Montus, it comes positive. When we treat it with ATT, it does not work. So let's get Soumya's viewpoint on these two. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the second question first. Uh, so if you look at the sun classification system, you know, that does not include intermediate uveitis as one of the predictive signs of ocular tuberculosis. So definitely the possibility of your intermediate uveitis being due to tuberculosis is relatively low on the scale. It's not impossible for sure. Dr. Vishali has a very nice presentation and you'll find a 
very good algorithm for the diagnosis of intermediate uveitis in that uh, in in that paper it's published in 2012 uh, so but generally i find you know two conditions where ocular tuberculosis is most over diagnosed one of them is intermediate uveitis the other is non granulomatous anterior uveitis these are the two places where it's most over diagnosed at least in the indian scenario and we should be very cautious in calling it tb now for the treatment part uh, i i always look for evidence of the systemic association of the intermediate uveitis and my treatment is mainly guided by the systemic association it could be a sarcoid it could be tuberculosis you know but when we do not find a systemic uh, association then i have a low threshold for pars plana vitrectomy in these patients if you look at the site study data uh, uh, from from uh, the us you will see that pars plana vitrectomy was one of the factors that had better uh, uh you know that was responsible for be better final outcomes so but of course you have to take it very very cautiously it, it's not a decision that is to be taken lightly there are many uh, contraindications for doing pars plana vitrectomy in these patients i definitely won't do it uh, in a patient with hypotony uh, i won't do it in a pediatric patient and i'll be very cautious while you know examining the peripheral fundus in these patients after the vitrectomy so professor mcclaxy coming to the same question of pars plana vitrectomy as a therapeutic modality for intermediate uveitis where you have and my second question again to you is that these cells the chronic dead cells are going to persist so i think it's a very important message for them that do not keep on looking at those dead cell to titrate your response to therapy so what imaging modality do you use to know that patient is becoming quiet or not yeah look uh, it's a yeah, it's a very important area we we tend to try and not minimize our treatment but have a specific indication for starting treatment uh, and in my unit that's most commonly macular edema associated with vision loss patients are often very distressed and unhappy about floaters <clears throat> but the floaters as you say a lot of them are dead cells and debris they're not an inflammatory mediated threat to vision so we try to minimize treatment and indeed often we see patients who've come to our clinic with a history of recurring episodes of floaters and steroids and they keep going around and around with short courses of steroids to get rid of the floaters and they keep coming back and the whole time they've got normal vision no macular edema a normal wide field angiogram so we counsel those patients that there is no indication for immunosuppression there so uh, we try not to treat the patient unless there's a specific indication that said there are a group of patients that do get quite florid macular edema disc swelling microvascular leak and they have a significant threat to vision and they're the patients that do need uh, immunomodulatory therapy and immunosuppression and they often need that for several years to to get the disease under control there are a subset of those patients particularly if they have asymmetrical disease where sometimes doing a vitrectomy in the worse eye will get rid of sort of recalcitrant macular edema deal with epiretinal membranes and really improve uh, the visual outcome in those eyes but we tend to do less vitrectomies and more sort of treat to target immunosuppressive therapy i think it's a very important point uh, that uh, professor mcclexy has put across is a patient with with intermediate uveitis or pars planitis would have some cells there is no need to panic and start steroids all over again if the visual acuity is stable if there is no disc edema if there is no macular edema and those cells are just there which you are not sure whether they are from past episode or they are from somebody else who's treating them please do not panic and start because we see lot many times 
when these patients come back to you they are already on started on steroids because the cells uh, were seen so the interpretation of that could be very variable so that's a very important point and second is the cells are not going to disappear so please don't use the cell as a criteria to increase or decrease your therapy some of them the chronic ones will always remain this brings to the second point the wide field angiography and lot of us are doing it now and we are seeing some stuff which we were not seeing early which we do not know what to do with it whether it is small children with jia or it is some vasculitis in the periphery now the question is to all the three panelists patient is not really having decreased vision but you did a wide field angiography and you have seen some vasculitis would you treat it somya yeah but before i go forward since i'm you know uh, put the point of pars planar vitrectomy i would want to emphasize here that the vitrectomy is just an adjunctive treatment it cannot be the primary treatment for intermediate uveitis or any other form of uveitis it and it has to be done by an extremely expert surgeon smallest gauge possible 27g and there is always a diagnosis component attached even to therapeutic vitrectomy so you should have a good support system in the lab who can take the sample so it's very good but it's not trivial is that right absolutely yeah, yeah. Now coming to the question of you know using wide field angiography as a, a method for titration of therapy yes we do it in fact my most common indication of fluorescein angiography in the uveitis clinic now is intermediate uveitis because we use it not only uh, in, in patients who have relatively less vitritis but significant macular edema where we do not understand the amount of retinal inflammation clinically but also when we are looking at the end point of treatment where to stop treatment th that is useful to us having said that there are cases for example a, a a uh, couple of months ago there was this kid who came to us for general examination and I, i saw two snowballs in the inferior periphery in one eye and when i did a wide field angiogram there was a sectoral area of uh, capillary ferning in the area of snowball the child didn't have any complaints and there was you know a little difficulty in the way the child could follow up uh, where he came from so i preferred not to do any treatment just based on that uh, ferning that i saw in the sector and i uh, you know inform the parents about the need to follow up very frequently i totally agree with you peter would you do any different like would you treat all the peripheral leaks no no, no. i i think you've got to have posterior yeah. pole and macular edema leak yeah so that's a very important point like wide field you are seeing a lot of peripheral vasculitis 3 years from ago we were all very excited and treating but they do not require treatment uh in my in our viewpoint and that brings to another important aspect the fuchs uveitis you know many a times the fuchs can present mostly in the vitreous and it can produce some vitreous floaters you do see some cells and when you do angiography you would see the disc becoming hyper in the late phase it's just staining it's not really leaking or anything there won't be cystoid macular edema occasionally there might be very mild peripheral vasculitis please do not confuse fuchs with intermediate uveitis because many patients with fuchs uveitis are started on immunosuppression which is not good so dr biswas any particular thing you would like to say about fuchs and vitreitis i just counsel these patients and don't uh, treat them and it's sometimes they feel quite bothering uh, regarding that uh, white field angiogram i find that capillary ferning with the treatment also if you repeat of the 6 months persists. after it doesn't go off so yes many so times our fellows you know them. yeah only last week one of my fellows wanted to start biologic because the fern was not completely gone i think that's not what we are getting at and the last to peter 
we are in the country where everything seems like tuberculosis to us. So <laughs> when you look at a patient with scleritis, are there any typical markers you are looking for in fictive form of scleritis? Yeah. So I, I think certainly in my, uh, in my part of the world, it's someone who's come from an endemic region, someone who's got active systemic TB, so that they've got multi-bacillary disease elsewhere, or they've got you know, uh, multi-organ involvement. Um, outside of that, I think in my country, tuberculous scleritis is very uncommon. In your part of the world, it is much commoner. Uh, I remember um, making a terrible error in Thailand many years ago, saying that you could use subconjunctival steroids for non-necrotizing scleritis, and then they pointed out that 50% of their scleritis was tuberculous. So I think the key message is it's where your patient comes from and where you are practicing in the world that are the two biggest risk factors for tuberculous scleritis. Nodules, uh, necrosis, uh, seeing an area of pus as you could see in my patient that I presented earlier are the clinical clues that make you think about tuberculous scleritis. Thank you. So, uh, is there any role, uh, Soumya, would you ever do scleral biopsy if you're not suspecting infection? And if you're suspecting infection, what in the time frame would you consider doing a scleral biopsy? Yeah, I think if you're, consi if you're worried it's infection, we try and do a biopsy as soon as we practically can because that is really important in guiding your therapy and these days in looking for uh, drug resistance to work out what are the appropriate antibiotics to use. These patients quite commonly have difficult organisms to treat different fungi and uh, pseudomonas that has variable drug resistance. The time in someone where I initially wasn't worried that they had an infectious scleritis that I worry about a biopsy is if the clinical picture is abnormal. In my country, not uncommonly, we see patients who look like they've got scleritis but actually have actinic uh, cancers. They have uh, squamous cell cancers and, and ocular surface neoplasia. So if there's a lot of signs but not a lot of pain, that is an indication to think about a biopsy. And the other time is if you've treated the patient with what you think is the appropriate treatment and it's clearly not responding or in fact getting worse, you need to reconsider your diagnosis. So the last leg, I think we have three more minutes to go about pediatric uveitis. So we start with Peter. Scleritis in a child, how would your approach be different? Yep. So scleritis in a child is very uncommon, but it definitely does occur. Uh, I tend to use the same sieve, it's clinical assessment, uh, making sure that there are no associated diseases that uh, haven't been disclosed to us by going back over the history. Uh, it's not uncommon for scleritis to be idiopathic in children. Uh, most of the nasty causes of scleritis occur in adults rather than in children, so it's most commonly unrelated to systemic disease. Uh, and I tend to treat it in using the same algorithm, so non-steroidals, oral steroids, uh, and methotrexate, and if you need to, a biologic. Thank you. Soumya, anterior uveitis in a child. Yeah, I think that's the most common uh, presentation of pediatric uveitis we have. And we have studies uh, from your center as well as from the US, which tell us that of all the pediatric uveitis, roughly one third would be GIE associated uveitis. One third, you may not be able to find a cause while the remaining third would be, uh, you know, anything else that can occur in uh, adults. Now, you have to remember that uh, majority of cases of JIA associated uveitis uh, are associated with ANA positivity. So ANA is the test that you would want to do in these patients. The kids very often come to us at a very late stage, especially if they do not have any systemic man manifestations, because there's no redness or pain and the child is not aware 
what kind of vision is a poor vision. So by the time the parent is able to find out that, you know, the vision is gone, it's quite late. Uh, I had a question on pediatric pediatrics for both of you, and this is about the use of intraocular lens in pediatric cataract surgery. And so, you know, a quick uh, opinion on. I will never put an IOL in a child with GIS. Yeah. With biologics, however, the things are changing, but maybe we will be more comfortable. But what we have done in the past, they are not behaving well. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, now that we can control JIA with biologics and get the disease absolutely controlled in older children, we now will put in uh, an intro. We are not seeing BSKs, any of those manifestations if you start mm. biologics early. I, I and agree. hypotony. I was speaking yeah. at a hypotony web in here. Yeah. And we don't see hypotony yep. anymore. We're, right? we're doing far less surgery in our JIA patients in general, much less glaucoma surgery and less cataract surgery, because for the first time we can actually control the uveitis. Yeah. So, so for JIA, which is juvenile idiopathic arthritis, uveitis, you have to start treatment aggressively very soon. Because otherwise, what Soma is referring to you, if you are on traditional like steroids and methotrexate, so many of them develop a lot of ocular complication. So if a child with JIA has synechia, posterior synechia, peripheral anterior synechia, exclusive pupillae, and you have not managed them, uh, I'm not saying you haven't managed them well, if the inflammation has not been controlled, then there is, please do not put an IOL in this child. However, if the child has been under the care right from the beginning, received biologics, has not developed synechia, very well controlled, then that becomes a different thing altogether. But for convention, if you are seeing synechia and a bad case, please avoid IOL because there is a lot of ACO, PCO, phimosis, and we will soon be coming out with data of 20 years experience with these children, and majority of them have done very poorly despite being under our care and despite being on conventional DMARDs. So there is a distinct difference before and post biologic era, especially for JIA. Dr. Biswas, would you like to give any last comment? I have been routinely now putting the JIA with uh, uveitis on adalumumab. Yes. I find a lot of difference. But I have not still started putting, uh, recommending IOL in Yes, because in they cases. are different. They are not the same as with the conventional DMARDs. So, so they, they don't develop synechia or anything. It's really so, changed. And the other thing which we have realized in JIA is that when you do angiography, quite a few of them actually show the small vessel capillary leak on angiography. And when we started looking, like quite a few of them are coming out to be blau and tinus and things we were not looking for earlier. So every JIA is not only anterior uveitis, and every JIA is, every anterior uveitis is not JIA. So there may be a lot more that we do not understand. But I think we have given a very comprehensive view of what the comprehensive ophthalmologists should or should not do when a patient with uh, uveitis walks to your clinic. If there are any questions last minute, we'll be happy to answer. If there are none, on behalf of the International Uveitis Study Group, on behalf of Soumya, Peter, and Professor Dr. Biswas, I would like to thank you all for being such a good audience and spending the afternoon with us. Thank you very much.